Hey, this is Dr. Ben White's host of the Rational Wellness Podcast. I talk to the leading health and nutrition experts and researchers in the field to bring you the latest in cutting edge health information. Subscribe to the Rational Wellness Podcast for weekly updates. And to learn more, check out my website, drwhites.com. Thanks for joining me, and let's jump into the podcast. Hello, Rational Wellness Podcasters. Thank you so much for joining me again today for another discussion on an important functional medicine topic. For those of you who enjoy listening to the Rational Wellness Podcast, please go to Apple Podcasts and give us a ratings and review. That will help move us up the rankings and help more people find the Rational Wellness Podcast. If you'd like to see a video version of our podcast, please go to my YouTube page. And if you go to my website, drwhites.com, you can find detailed show notes and a complete transcript. Our topic for today is epigenetics and cellular detox with licensed acupuncturist, Dr. Ashley Beckman. Our genetics are the DNA code that we inherit from our parents. And these direct the activities of our cells, and our DNA code does not change over time. Our DNA code is a sequence of nucleotide bases known as adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. I know that's kind of scientific jargon, but um, it's the specific sequence of these A, C, G, and T bases Uh, This is the code that provides the instructions for our cells to make specific proteins that trigger various biological functions in our body, including the production of insulin, for example. The definition of epigenetics, epigenetics is a set of uh, triggers and switches that turn our genes off or on. And so epigenetics doesn't modify the genetic code, but it modifies the expression of our genes. And our genes, our epigenetics, is based on a whole series of factors, including environmental factors, diet, lifestyle, and our exposure to toxins. Such toxins that have been shown to be drivers of epigenetic processes include heavy metals, pesticides, diesel exhaust, tobacco smoke, bisphenol A, mycotoxins, radioactivity, as well as hormones, bacteria, and basic nutrients. Some of our genes get switched on and get expressed, and other of our genes get turned off and do not get expressed. The other part of our discussion is about detoxification. And detoxification is how we get rid of toxins that we've been exposed to over our lives and that may be stored in our cells, our organs, and even our bones. This occurs naturally on a daily basis, but we can also stimulate the detoxification process by doing a detoxification program which often involves some form of fasting combined with taking specific nutrients to support the liver detoxification pathways, to support cellular detoxification, and to support the various forms of elimination, including the digestive tract, and to facilitate sweating, another form of elimination, such as by using infrared sauna. Dr. Ashley Beckman is a licensed acupuncturist and herbalist and a doctor of Chinese medicine practicing in Los Angeles. She received her doctorate in healthy aging and longevity and wrote her thesis on epigenetics, the study of how our genes are affected by our diet and lifestyle, as I just mentioned. She specializes in healthy aging, epigenetics, detoxification, pain management, fertility, treatment of headaches, stress reduction, and facial rejuvenation. She also co-founded Golden Path Alchemy, an organic skincare company based on the principles of traditional Chinese medicine. Dr. Beckman, thank you so much for joining me today. It's a pleasure to see you and be here today. Good, good. So let's start by uh, giving some definitions. I know I've gone into it some, but why don't you explain what epigenetics is? Sure. So epigenetics is the study of certain mechanisms such as diet, lifestyle, 
um, behavioral choices that we have, like exercise and um, these different factors we have in our different in the way we live. And basically, these can switch our genes on or off. So one thing that I really like about this is that, you know, we have a lot more control over our health destiny than what we have been known to believe in the past. So many people just believe if something has been passed you down to you by your parents, that you're destined to get this and more likely doomed to get it. And so people just really focus and are scared for their future. And I love this theory of epigenetics because we really have a lot more control than people had thought before. Right. Our genes are not our destiny. No. And I say they're our greatest opportunity. Great. <laughs> so um, the other part of our discussion is going to be about cellular detox. Maybe you could explain what is cellular detox. Sure. So um, there are, you know, the word detox gets thrown around all the time, and people equate this with you know a three day juice cleanse that they pick up at a juice bar. And um, especially as someone coming from Chinese medicine, you really need to tailor things towards someone's constitution. So even on the detox level, we have to know how the body is and even some genetic predispositions and how we detox, like how our um, phase one and phase two pathways are wired so that we can actually tailor a detox specific to that person. Some detox that you pick up, you know, like I said, like at a juice bar or um, even off the shelf at Whole Foods, it's not going to be exactly what you specifically need. And so uh, cellular detox, really, we want to get in, make sure that you're targeting all the areas that really need to be addressed and taking the right supplements and then kind of what you were speaking about, all the other lifestyle factors that accommodate what is needed in a detox with from mindset to um, some fasting, the right foods and the right supplements. So something that's very targeted and actually effective. Okay, so with respect to epigenetics, um, how do we find out what our epigenetics are? Well, so the main way is you basically, what I do with patients is I, you take someone's raw genetic data. So you get a test. Um, there are various ones out there. I have utilized raw genetic data that people have already received from somewhere else, like 23andMe, or um, there's a various amount of companies now. Ancestry. But, what, so um, why don't we talk a bit uh, for a minute about which is the best one to use? Because um, sure. for a while I heard that 23andMe was providing the most amount of genes, and then they changed the way they do their testing, so they actually provide fewer genes. Yeah. What do you think is the best uh, company to use if we have a choice? Sure. So I use a company called Apiron, and that's um, the company that I've actually trained with and studied with. They do not store your data, and it's actually extremely private. Your name is not associated with the barcode on your test. So okay. that is something because they will never sell your data. And I think that that is actually one of the most important pieces right now. And you're referring to the fact that 23andMe and Ancestry, um, the way they uh, make a lot of their money is by selling your data to be used for research by Big Pharma and others. Yes, I, I, I believe that that's accurate. I think a lot of the companies out there are sort of data mining companies. And um, we're there, you know, you get in exchange the, the, your raw genetic data, but at the same time, um, I caution anyone who has not done that already to pick another company that does not work in the same manner. Be, you mean for privacy concerns? For privacy, and the thing, this this whole area is very new, and um, nobody really knows what they're going to be doing with gathering all this genetic data. Um, so I think privacy is of utmost concern. Okay. And sometimes I tell people, you know, if you want a little bit more privacy, you could also, you know, maybe use a different name when you send it in, things like that. But at the same time, my, my number one choice is to tell people to use another company that doesn't do that. And the, the one that I'm secure with is a peer on. Okay. So uh, how do you use this peer on to find out about your genetic code and your epigenome? 
Sure. So the main, it's the same. It's a little um, swab that you do and the cheek swab, you send it in. And then about six weeks later, you're given your raw text file. And then, so what I do is I take that information and put it through a program and then also go through it with kind of like this long Excel sheet that I have that has a lot of different um, of the expressions and and what they can mean and what they're significant for, for different health reasons. So then I compile this report and I go over that with my clients. Um, and it looks at different factors. So it kind of looks at the foods that you eat, um, supplements, um, athleticism, hormones, the way you detox and sleep patterns. So, so those are so, main areas of epigenetics. So when you take the results from that test, what exactly are you getting? Are you getting the genetic code? Are you getting the epigenome? Can you explain? Um, sure. So it's, it's the genetic data. So it's your genetic blueprint. And it is um, grouped in certain, certain, it's, put in certain groups to test a variety of, of um, the SNPs together. So when you're looking at something- Can you explain what a SNP is? The, um, so that's basically just like the single nucleotide morphism. So it's basically just the little, it's the little genetic codes for each area. But what we do is we look at the ones. So, you, sorry, you need to look at a grouping of things. It's not that great to single out one genetic code and say, oh, now you have this. You know what I mean? We look at a group together, usually. What software do you prefer to use? It's, so I use the software from Appearon. Okay. Then, yeah, and then I pair that with, um, like I said, this kind of like long Excel sheet that then I dive deeper into um, which one is the norm and which, which one is the exception. And so then it gives you some more probabilities of of this, of how this might express in your system. So this is all just the genes. And then- So how many genes are you analyzing with this software? Oh, shoot. I would have to look it up. I don't remember. Okay, okay. <laughs> I'll look it up so you can put it in the, in the notes though. Okay, so- um, But so it's very you, comprehensive. Okay, and then what do you, what do you, how does this help us? So, so for example, one of my favorite areas is it gives an insulin resistance score. So this is a probability that you might have based on your genes of your probability of having an issue or developing type 2 diabetes. So it basically, for me, and especially because I'm um, very passionate about getting people um, to reduce their sugar consumption and because I think that it has such long lasting effects, but a lot of these uh, clients have a high insulin resistance resistance score. So, and they might not even know that they could be someone though, that tends to be eating a lot of starchy carbs and things like that, and is not really that cognizant of how much sugar they're eating. And so when I see this in someone's um, report, to me, it's, it's a really big push for, for them to start being mindful of that and to change that. Because that's, as you probably see with your clients as well, prediabetes is so rampant. And most people in their 50s and 60s, and unfortunately now children, are getting prediabetes um, at much younger ages. And so it's something we can completely prevent. Which is the gene that codes, uh, which gene or genes are the ones that most commonly code for insulin resistance? Are you, do you know those offhand? I don't know them offhand, but I oh, have okay. them. Okay. You want me to give? I have them right here. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So the thing about the genes that's kind of so okay. This grouping is actually about twenty genes that we use to look to oh, pull the, the, the twenty insulin. genes for insulin resistance. Okay. Yeah. So this is one thing that I think is very important. That I touched on a bit is it's these grouping of genes. Often, you know, we hear about like one specific gene all the time but it really is how they work together. So this, it's never, that's one thing I really like about this company too, like is that it's never just one gene and then you create this whole idea around it. Um, we hear about these, you know, famous genes sort of from certain people. And I think a lot is- built Some of these that. genes are, are now being referred to as diseases. I have yeah, MTHFR. I have MTHFR. Right. <laughs> Exactly. And um, there's actually a kind of a, a little joke that a 
a friend of mine who's another functional medicine doctor said, uh, he just is kind of like, you know, no one would know that unless you recently went to a functional medicine doctor and you were told you now have this, you know, terrible disease that you need to change all these things. Or they could they could have gone to Dr. Google or Dr. YouTube. Yes. I know the amount of people actually that talk to me um, and ask about it. Again, I just say, actually, you know, we look at a bit of a grouping of of a lot of genes to kind of see how how big of an impact that might be for you. But that's just one of them. You know what I mean? There's a whole lot that are, um, like I said, they're getting- So when a patient them. has, um, how, do you, how do you determine how significant these genes are? So let's say you have one copy, yeah. which means you're um, or heterozygous, or two copies, which means you're homozygous, or you could have multiple copies of one, a uh, uh, multiple versions of one copy of these different genes. <laughs> How do you know when it really matters? And then, um, you know, is this? Um, do you do you need to wait until they have um, positive uh, testing in terms of uh, fasting glucose and hemoglobin A one C, etc.? So no, so one thing that I like about this is that um, they they give us clues. You know, certain they give us areas to focus on. So there are certain genes that have more weight than others. So that's why you know these ones. It is true the ones that are more well known have more weight. But again, it's still the grouping. So let's say you have one that is more um, more weighted and more significant, but then you have three that are totally normal. So then that averages your risk down a little bit less than if you were just looking at that one gene because you do need to look at them together that i mean the genetic code doesn't work independently and genes don't work independently unless it's something very specific that has a genetic you know very specific genetic disease where there's one you know when you have that switch on one specific thing that it actually creates a very specific pattern or disease in somebody but those aren't as common as these groupings creating a probability so if let's say sense. they have a, let's say they have an increased risk for um, insulin resistance but they actually have a fasting glucose of 80 and a fasting insulin of 3 and their hemoglobin a1c is 5.0 what do you do with that so yeah, so if so, one this is another thing I love. I love having this and then backing it up with data. So I love using you know even regular lab lab tests and then functional lab labs to basically get a better idea of what's actually happening right now because the gen, the genes give you your blueprint and some of your probabilities, your lifestyle, your emotions, your you know exercise habits. Those are what really can turn things on and off and make significant change. So when you um, have some of these probabilities and then yet yeah, you get you look and see what their hemoglobin A1C is and it's, it's steadily creeping up and creeping up, then you know this, this person needs to make significant changes so that they can revert back to somebody who doesn't have those extra probabilities or um, increased probability of getting the type 2 diabetes. So does everybody who uh, has some of those genes that code for increased insulin resistance, do they all need to follow a low-carb diet? Well, so again, I would say I like to look at them individually. Certain people um, constitutionally, ac according to Chinese medicine, you know, do better with some starches and grains. A lot of people don't, um, especially if there's some sort of autoimmune issues happening, things like that. I personally don't think anybody does well with refined sugar. I mean, that's not any type of news. But my main thing is really getting people just cognizant of how much sugar they're getting that they're not even realizing. Most people never flip something over and read the label. I tell everybody if there's you know double digits, 10 grams of sugar in something, you should not be eating it. And then I give them an amount per day, so a max of 25 grams a day. Um, and But that's... I, my goal, like I said, is I don't, I don't want people really having much sugar at all. There's no benefit of having refined sugar. It actually is just more detrimental. And people, once they get it out, they start to feel better. And it has a long, a long reach, I believe, in their health span in multiple ways. Right. Okay. 
So um, give us some other examples of what you get from the doing the genetics and then how does explain how epigenetics uh, factors in here. Sure. So um, the epigenetics part really is, you know, that that is not tested in kind of what you're getting with the raw genetic data. The raw genetic data shows you what areas you could fo focus on. So like which foods would be helpful to um, to silence some genes that might create a problem. So, or the same, it's like, it talks about it's supplements. So sometimes certain supplements would be toxic to somebody if they take too much. But for example, a lot of people were taking a lot of vitamin E for a long time um, as an antioxidant. It's one that can be toxic for a lot of people if they take too much of it. So it actually shows vitamin that- Vitamin E? Yes. So- but it shows that in the, in the raw genetic data. So some of those are pretty interesting. And then also yeah. checking the types of the B vitamins to take um, for vitamin D. Some, it shows, which is pretty interesting, if people can get the benefit from the sunlight and absorbing it, or if they're not someone that actually um, can absorb much of the D from sunlight. Because I'm sure, as you've seen with some of your patients, some people can absorb it really well, and some people don't. So even though they're in the sun all the time, they're still deficient. I'm, I'm amazed in Southern California how many people get exposed to sun all the time and their vitamin D levels are low. Right, yeah. I think it's more common than not. Yeah, and a lot of people think, they just think that, and actually I was one prior to testing it, is I just thought, there's no way, I'm in the sun constantly, and you know, the first time I checked, I think I was at 19. So, wow, and I literally, well. you know, always in the sun because I love sun. So it's, I'm just not someone that actually absorbs it from the sun. So I need the supplementation. So that's one thing that I really love again is I'm sure you go by this too, is test, don't guess. So we Absolutely. assume all the time these things that we hear and kind of have known for a while but they're not always accurate yeah we occasionally get people with uh, modest amounts of supplementation that their levels shoot up but more common it, it's really hard to get the levels up and yeah. sometimes doing modest supplementation like a thousand or two thousand milligrams of vitamin d doesn't do anything and it's not unusual that we have to go to like ten thousand a day yeah. to get yeah. up to those target ranges that we're trying to hit like 50 to 70 or 60 to 80 or something like that nanograms per milliliter right yeah and that's not something you know from sort of the in the natural medicine world we have not heard that we just thought oh if you get you're out in the sun in the right hours of day without sunscreen you're fine and as you know vitamin d is one of those precursors that it's implicated in over 200 genetic processes. So it's crucial on so many levels that it's actually in an optimal range. Yeah. And of course we got, uh, we can measure vitamin D receptors and whether people are gonna respond and produce vitamin E or uh, absorb the vitamin D that they uh, take in. So um, uh, how does um, uh, genetics, how does that change um, a detox program? Oh, sure. So um, I can give an example of myself for one. Okay. So I'm someone who, since high school, I've been doing detoxes. I, you know, studied with doc studied um, Dr. Schultz's products, got into that. Okay. Since, you're from L since you're from LA, right? Or you're in LA. I've been doing Dr. Schultz's products since I was a kid. Um, I've been obsessed with detoxes since I was little. And, um, you know, I did them seasonally, all of that. And, and, and what did most of these detoxes consist of? Oh, sorry. Okay. So it's like a bowel, kidney, liver um, detox with herbs and just raw foods. It was five days. Um, but I would say- So for five days, you eat raw foods and you take uh, a series of supplements in pill or tincture and, form? Yeah. Tinctures, pills, and tea. And, okay. um, you know, I did this for years. I, well, I wouldn't say I loved it, but I love detoxing. And so- um, you know, I really thought that I was just cleaning everything out. It was great. Um, 
And then I even did these things for preconception planning. I'm a huge fan of preconception planning, checking okay. for heavy metals, things like that. So I, and I had my daughter um, almost eight years ago now, but I thought I did all this to clean myself out. So I recently did some testing with Great Plains Lab, who I love. Um, their kind of organic acid test, their environmental toxin test. And um, it turns out on my environmental toxin test, it was one of the most toxic they'd ever seen. <laughs> No, it was terrible. And, and I mean, granted, I live in LA, so there's a lot, there's that factor, which is very big. Um, but I, I literally have, I don't use plastic ever. I don't use any, ever buy bottled water, only grass fed meat. Um, I'm one of the cleanest people that, you know, that you would come across. I, like I said, I even created my own skincare company because I was concerned that a lot of the things were stored in plastic when they had essential oils. So what kind of toxins showed up and where do you think you got these from? So, um, well, basically almost, I think it was 15 out of the ones that they tested were all 75 to 95%. Um, that means that I was in like the highest group possible. Right. Which, so, what kinds of toxins were these? So um, they were still the ones from the plastic. So the biosphenol A, the that the and the ones that have that are all with the gasoline very high and that okay. makes sense because I live in LA like MTBE and yeah the MTBE was very high um, uh, the percolates high so that again is from the air generally and the rocket fuel I believe <laughs> which was dumped into the water and yeah and that's the thing um but like still found I, in colorado river and where we get some of our water in southern california yeah and again those things aren't filtered out with filtered water i mean not everything can be i mean again it depends on your system that you have but um a lot of the organophosphates from pesticides things like that and that's the thing that was shocking. That might be a good marketing um, strategy. Get your rocket fuel water. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And it, it seeps into the groundwater. I mean, it's terrible. And, you know, you do everything you can, right? I mean, I buy organic products, but then I still eat out at restaurants. And, not, and I tell this to patients, too. I mean, the, the meat is not grass-fed out. And the, generally, the fruits and vegetables aren't organic. No. Unless you're really um, going for that. So that's the thing is that I know a lot of it is because I live in Los Angeles, but the main factor, which came back to my genetics, is that I don't um, process or make glutathione like much at all. Okay. So I had never taken any uh, precursors for glutathione. I'd never taken glutathione. I was doing these kind of traditional detoxes. Um, that were still very strong, but they didn't actually work for my system. So I had also gone to the process where I was doing IV glutathione, and it made me so sick within about five seconds. So I realized that something was, you know, that pushed toxins into my system, and they were recirculating, and then I felt sick instantly. So that's one of the things that can happen when you do a detox is – uh, a lot of these toxins may be stored somewhere in your body. And if you um, use a strategy that helps remove some of these toxins, um, they may not get all the way removed. So they may come out of storage into circulation, and then that can create a lot of uh, detox reactions like you're describing. Right. And so now um, the products I use – are very different and they go in to soak those up so that you're basically I, my whole goal is to really minimize any sort of like detox reactions that people have and I think a lot of the things that we used before if your body and detox pathways weren't primed to deal with that that's where everyone's getting really sick and you know nauseous and headaches and those are just minimal side effects so it's really important to do a a detox properly and prime the pathways and have the binders in there that will soak it up properly. Okay. So you're saying you, your detox now that you're doing involves binders and what are some of the substances involved in binders? Um, so I use some products that have fulvic and humic acids. Um, I like them a lot. The way that they have been described to me is that they, um, they are much more, 
effective and powerful at soaking up things beyond an activated charcoal because the activated charcoal doesn't have enough energy left in it to actually go in and soak up a lot of that. Activated charcoal is one of the most common substances uh, being sold a, a, as part of a binding uh, product or separately. And in fact, charcoal is uh, uh, right now being used in many consumer products. You can buy it. Is. <laughs> charcoal lemonade. <laughs> exactly. And charcoal toothpaste. It's everywhere. Yeah. So, um, um, yeah. So I um, have changed what I've done. So those two, what other substances do you find effective for as binding agents? What about modified citrus pectin? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I like that. Um, and it's cilantro. Uh, yes. Yeah. And it just depends the, um, you know, everyone is a little bit different. So some people can handle one type and other people can't. Some people are so sensitive and so, um, bound up that they basically really need something super gentle. And I, sometimes I start people off with a homeopathic detox so I can go drop by drop because there are patients that are that sensitive. So, um, you know, there's a wide spectrum, but I think that it's really important to prep the body before kind of dumping it, like getting all these toxins, just dumping into your system without anywhere to go. How long should a detox program take? Um, I would say always customize to the patient kind of, so that's why I like the testing, um, because we want to see if there's mold exposure, what the viral load is possibly, um, what the bacteria situation is, um, what's going on with the gut, fungal issues, metals, parasites. So it all depends. So how do you determine what testing to do and what testing is, a? do you have a standard screen or does it depend on history? Yeah, it depends on history. I, I pretty much always run the organic acids test um, with Great Plains. I love the mycotoxin test if they have anything positive on the oat. Um, I love the environmental toxin test to see what's happening there. Um, some sort of heavy metal testing. I use the mercury tri test a lot from Quicksilver. Okay, so that's that utilizes a combination of serum, urine, and hair mercury testing. Yes. And then, um, and then, still, if they need to check for other metals, can do a metals test. Um, let's see what else. I love. I mean, I add in the genetics so that we can put that piece in there, and then. Um, and then some, sometimes like a GI map for stool or for, to see what's going on in the gut or as a zoomer test, gut zoomer test. Okay. So the, um, just out of curiosity, what, what's the approximate cost of that genetic test you're talking about? Um, so the genetic test varies based on kind of how many areas you want to look at. So, um, people can get, let's see. Like it's just ballpark. All right, like a thousand dollars. Okay. Yeah. Now they can get a twenty-three and Me or Ancestry for a hundred. Is yes. it that much better? So, oh well, I I I just think that twenty-three and Me is sort of fluff. It's not actual information that you can utilize much for your health. Oh, That's okay. But it has, you know, like, it's like, oh, do you turn red when you're drinking? Um, do you have, you know. No, but, but just, even if you get the raw oh, data, there's yeah. not enough genes there? So, no, they've changed it a bit, and there are less. But there, I mean, yes, the raw data on itself is good, but you are giving up your privacy, which I 100% think is not a good idea. I, I agree, but I doubt there's any privacy in our society since they're monitoring every phone call, every true. email. Uh, I know. <laughs> That's true. I mean, they really could, I mean, you know, if someone really needed to, they could link up everything that you, if they were really trying to find that out for you. Your phone is monitoring every place you're going. Your phone right now knows that you're talking to me, where you are. I, mean, I know. Yeah. And I know it's so scary. We'll just, t you could talk about something, your phone's off, and then that's all your Instagram feed, Facebook feed, uh, you know, everything. So it's true. There really is. Absolutely. No I got in my car this morning and my phone says it's 13 minutes of Gold's Gem. How do you know I'm going to Gold's Gem? Right. <laughs> <laughs> 
I know it's pretty scary. So, so how does the detox program you, you were talking about sure. epigenetics changing your detox? So, give me a little more meat on the bones there about how you change the detox according to uh, epigenetics. Um, so basically what I do is, I mean, I have a, a program that I use with a lot of people, but what gets tailored is kind of what we focus on first based on what shows up in their labs um, and then with their genes. So if there's somebody that can process um, toxins better, then they might need, they might not need as much time in the prep phase. Um, or if there's somebody who is, tends to be more sensitive to metals, then we might need to work on that a lot longer. What's, what's the prep phase? Oh, sorry. So that's where we, well, I have, you know, certain people need certain foundations. So that would be where I would put in certain vitamin deficiencies that they might have um, or just optimizing some of their nutrient levels so that they're sort of prepared to um, start a detox. And then again, it's, and this part is a bit traditional. We still want to make sure that the bowel is functioning really well. If someone's constipated, you have to get that under control before you start anything. So number one, you want to make sure somebody's not deficient in nutrients. How do you determine that? You do some sort of nutrient panel? Um, yes, I can do a nutrient panel. The organic acid test does have part of that in there. Oh, okay. Utilize as well. Um, you know, there are special tests you can do in addition. Um, too, to just kind of see there's a spectra cell has a micronutrient deficiency panel, which can be good if people like that. Um, so, but I also, I use the organic acid one quite a bit. Okay. Um, so you'll, you'll uh, beef them up with some nutrients first to get them ready for the detox. Yes. Then we look at their bowel and make sure that, like I said, they're not constipated. Make sure they're going to the bathroom um, twice a day is ideal. Because if, they, if they're constipated, they're going to be recirculating the toxins, correct? Yeah. yeah, and that happens a lot with estrogens and different toxins and things like that. So, um, and then we, then we start, then we make sure we look at the, the lymph, the kidney, kidneys, and the liver. So we have, I have special supplements for that. As well. How do you how do you look at those? Sorry, not look. I just mean address. Oh, you okay. So important. you give them supplements to make sure those are working properly. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then we figure out. Um, what do you do what, to make? What do you give them to make sure the kidneys are functioning properly? Um, let's see. So there's some different herbs that. Sorry, there's some herbs that I use. So I like some homeopathic tinctures too. Um, you mean which specific herbs? Um, I, you know, I was just curious. So you have, um, so you have some kidney formula you like to use and yeah. some, I, like, I use cell core products a lot. Um, I really like them. Um, they have a good, a great kidney liver formula. Um, and then, I mean, I've used other ones in the past too. So I also use some products from designs for health. They have some great detox packets that are super simple and all together. And then they have some that are spread out or in individual products. Okay. So, okay. Yeah, go ahead. So, okay, so, so you then, support the lymphatics, the kidneys, yeah. the liver. Yep. Um, then we need to make sure to the, what's going on with the gut. So we need to see if there's any intestinal permeability um, to make sure that we're working on the lining. To, I check if there's someone who has a lot of autoimmune or food sensitivities, we need to make sure that that's a big factor. Um, see if they need to eliminate some foods just temporarily if it's making things worse. So um, often I see you know, a lot of issues with gluten, dairy, and sugar. Um, nobody really likes to hear that. But um, initially, I just ask if they can try to go off things for you know, maybe 30 days minimum to just see if we can get some inflammation down as well from what they're putting in their body. So what's a specific uh, food regimen you put them on? You eliminate um, gluten, dairy, and what else did you say? Sh refined sugar. And refined sugar. Other, and then, other things or just those three? Um, so it all depends on the person. So if there's somebody who already has a lot of issues, um, we need to see what would be specific for them. Um, you know, some people are, you know, think they're totally healthy and um, they don't feel anything from food. So they, it's a big deal for them to just get off of sugar. So, you know, I work with them. I work with the client to see where they are too. But if you somebody- get them off of caffeine and alcohol as well while they're doing the detox? Yes. Yeah. Um, the caffeine, 
is less of an issue for me. If someone can get off all those other things and they still want one cup of coffee a day, usually I say that's okay. Especially but, if it's organic. Yeah, and if, and I love you know purity and bulletproof coffee. I at least send them to ones that are mycotoxin free and tested. Um, and just yeah, it's all about to me making healthier choices and swaps too. So if I can get people to just make some better choices in their life, you know, get off the, you know, granola, like granola and yogurt they start their day with that has 25 grams of sugar, get them on to something that's healthier. I think those are all big wins and can take them a long distance. Yeah, or their Count Chocula uh, cereal. <laughs> oh, yeah, if they even, if, yeah, or even Cheerios. It's like, you know, there's better things to do. There's yeah. all these, we have to pick our battles, right? And food is a really one that people like grip on and hold tight to. Um, or they have, again, you know, their favorite cup of coffee with sugar and cream. And so if I can get them to switch to a healthier version of that, then I feel like I've had a good win. So, and that they will benefit greatly. Because again, I say too, for people, we often have to look at our daily habits because it's in our daily habits where we see some of these really big things that make a big difference. So if we can change those. Um, it's big, very important. And even hydration. Many people still just don't drink enough water. And these are core foundations that if you don't have sleep, hydration, good food, and you know, exercise and some form of meditation, um, it's hard to build a base from that. How do you know if somebody's drinking enough water and how much water is enough? Um, so I look at their caffeine intake for sure. A lot of people are drinking way more caffeine than they're putting than water. So that's my first area to start with. Um, I still do go by kind of the half your, half your weight in ounces. I know some people say that works. Some people say it doesn't. I think it's a good, you know, barometer just to start with. Most people though, are drinking so little water that I tell them to just double what they're doing. And honestly, for a lot of people, they're drinking two glasses of water a day. Yeah. So yeah. then I say drink four and that seems like a stretch for them, but it's not a huge stretch. If I tell someone that's drinking two glasses to then go to, you know, half a gallon, that doesn't make any sense to me and they don't right. do it. So yeah. um, sometimes it's baby steps. And Try to meet them where they are and get them to make uh, changes that are reasonable. Exactly. So, um, yeah. So, again, those are some of those things that are kind of like in the beginning part of a detox and like the prep phase is really just getting their foundation solid and then getting them prepped so that we can then start um, addressing the things that are more pertinent and causing more damage, I guess I would say. So like the gut bacteria, the fungus, the, any sort of mycotoxins, viruses, bacteria, or sorry, parasites, and then um, metals we do last usually. Okay. So, so it, can be a long, it can be a while. Right. So multi phases of this program. Yeah. And it's based on, you know, the lab testing to see what's there. So um, we want to you know, a lot of for people in general, we have things we're basically a big host for a lot of different organisms. And so to think that they're not all living in us, I think is sort of um, inaccurate. So it's basically some things hide, you know, we have viruses that just lie dormant and then they get activated. So basically, if we can create our system to be a good environment, then it's kind of the best shot we have. And then showing so out things that are creating damage. So let's do a couple of uh, sample detox programs. Let's say the person tests high in mercury. What's your preferred sort of protocol for that? Um, so I, I do use a lot of um, Quicksilver products and Cellcore products. So okay. they have really great binders for pulling out heavy metals. Um, Cellcore has something called HMET, which I really love. Um, but again, this is the thing you know, this is all done after months of preparation. You don't just go in and start, you know, trying to pull out heavy metals, which is what everyone wants to do. And that's where people feel really sick. And another thing is um, heavy metals can reside inside parasites. So if you don't kill the parasites first, then you could be pulling out all these heavy metals and then you haven't even addressed the parasites and then you could be releasing more metals that you thought you'd cleaned up. 
So get so rid of parasites and clean up the gut. Um, get rid of nutritional deficiencies, shore the body up that way, support the basic organs, and, and then go for the, the metals and the other toxins. Yes. Yeah. Do you, do you incorporate glutathione in that detox protocol for mercury? I do. Um, I, I do use glutathione even um, earlier in the phase to just sort of start kind of helping support the liver, helping it support what already is there before we've kind of like really started to detox. Sometimes using a precursor like NAC, just it depends on how the person is um, and what they can handle. A lot of clients have had so many bad issues with um, taking like really strong chlorella um, things like that. So, you know, I just have to be careful with, like, I tend to get a lot of patients who are really sick and really toxic. So, um, it's just, you know, seeing what works for them and creating something that is, has the minimal side effects. So how long does it typically take to get rid of mercury? Ooh, <laughs> um, kind of depends on the levels and it could take a year, but that's the whole thing. You know what I mean? That's at the end. I don't, I wouldn't just target mercury and it would be so rare that nothing would come up before then. I mean, that actually wouldn't happen. Like, you know what I mean? No one would just have a mercury issue. I'll just say. Okay. So how, what's your protocol for mycotoxins, which is for mold? Right. So I, I again, I do use the, um, I do use the cell core products for that. Um, and so I, li I love the mycotoxin test because then you can kind of see exactly which, ha which ones are the strongest. And again, you still have to really prep the body first, um, of course, which we talked about. And then, uh, and then in Chinese medicine too, like we want to see what's happening with the lungs. So we want to support, sometimes I use some other herbs that are kind of like a lung support. Yeah, I know the mold, mold, that's the thing about mold is it can go everywhere and anywhere. So that's why it's extra de detrimental. But um, a lot of people, you know, a big part is from inhalation. So we all, I work on a bit with um, stored grief and sadness with the lungs. And we want to make sure just to always address the emotional issue of things. And detoxes stir up a lot because they deal with lungs, they deal with liver, which is um, related to like anger and resentment and depression. So a lot of people have some issues with that. So we just want to make sure and um, make sure that we're addressing the emotional side of things as well as the physical. Okay. How do you address the emotional side of things? Um, well, I love acupuncture. Um, and if someone's not local or, you know, not getting acupuncture on the side, um, there's visualizations with color that kind of support each organ. Um, and as with Chinese medicine, and as people know, the emotional side and the physical side, um, they're intertwined. So when we're treating a physical condition, we want to also address the emotional aspect of that. So one of my favorite things, again, is um, acupuncture, meditation, and then some visualization. Okay. Um, so I, I think that's... Um... I think that's pretty good. Um, yeah. Any other things? <laughs> covered a lot. You, yeah, I think we covered a lot. Any other specific things you'd like to uh, make the listeners aware of, or cover, or talk about? No, my main thing is that um, this is what I talk about with my clients every day. Is you know you have a choice every day. You choose what food you put in your body. You're choosing what products you put on your body. You're choosing some of the thoughts you have, the way you live your lifestyle. And it's so crucial for us to be mindful of what we're doing, that everything that we're doing is kind of either feeding our body or doing something that's going to make it harder and possibly leading to disease down the future. So we have so much control, and I think we forget that. And I see our body as a machine and what we're doing and putting into it as fuel. And we want to be putting the best quality fuel in it and um, you know, we have these beautiful bodies and so we just need to take care of them and you get to do that. All right. Um, how can listeners and viewers get a hold of you and find out how can they contact you? Um, sure. My website's, um, 
drashley.com and that's d-r-a-s-h-l-e-y.com and I always offer you know a complimentary call if someone wants to just see if we're a good fit to work together and so you can work with them by phone yes and uh, if they're in the Los Angeles area where's your practice um, I'm in Beverly Hills and in Malibu okay great yeah. um, thank you Dr. Beckman sure it was oh it's always fun <laughs> thank you